Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to have so many people attending live today. I am Dr. Sarah Beth Burke, author of More Than My Title, and I have a really awesome guest with me here who's Marcus Kirsch. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Sarah Beth. Hi, everyone. Marcus is joining us all the way from the UK. I'm in Colorado, so I'm just starting my day. He's ending his. It's kind of fun. We'll see how awake I am to get this started. Um, so this is going to be a really amazing discussion, and I've been looking forward to it a lot. I met Marcus um, as a podcast guest just a few weeks ago, and that episode will be released soon. And he's the founder of The Wicked Company and author of the book by the same title, and so we'll learn more about what that is today, but we had such great synergy in our conversation. I was talking about hybrid professionals and the future work. And while we were in the podcast, Mark was like, oh my gosh, maybe I need this too. And we said, well, what if we do that? Let's do a session to figure out your hybrid identity. So we are diving into this with you live, real time. Marcus and I have only done a tiny bit of prep just to help speed things up today. But what you're going to see is really how I work with people, how I think about professional identity with other workers and help them dig into what do you really do? I was struggling with that pain point for a long time. I didn't know how to explain what my value was in the workforce. How do I tell people I'm more than my job title when I do so many things? I really sound confusing. And so that's what more than my title is all about. It's letting people realize they can be multiple things and have multiple identities and that's their value add and secret sauce and so this is more than just a movement this is really a future of how the workforce is growing and changing and adapting especially in this new moment so i'm really excited to share more about how i do this work um if you want to introduce yourself in the chat say hello where you're from tell us how you're more than your job title um please feel free to put any notes in the chat and here's just a little overview of what we're gonna to do today. One, this is about you witnessing the process in action. I've got the book. I also have the How do I do this? But watching it in real time, so how, you know, Marcus might get stuck or not be sure of how to articulate something. And my role will be to push in and really reflect and listen and help him see new keywords and reframe his thinking. And ultimately, we're going to dive into shaping what his professional identity really is. Then you're also going to learn about Wicked Companies, and that has amazing parallel with hybrid workers because Wicked Companies are solving these complex problems, which are the future of work. And Marcus is going to help us understand what that is and why that matters so much. And we also want to help you see how you can jump in and take action after the masterclass. So there's a click for a giveaway and freebies button at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to jump into that anytime. And here's how we have a couple special things for you in there. If you want a copy of my book, More Than My Title, or Marcus's book, The Wicked Company, tag us on LinkedIn. There's info on that on the page when you click the button there. And you can also, I think, take a moment. There's a little button called Clip Moment on this screen. And you can quickly reshare that to LinkedIn. And then Marcus and I will choose the winners and let you know by Monday and send you a book. So that's kind of cool. There's some other things if you scroll down that page too, and um, just a lot of goodies for you today. So we're gonna get started, and this is roughly how the morning's gonna flow. I um, wanna do a little framing on hybrid professionals, but then I'm gonna go through my five-step process with Marcus. So we're gonna do this as a snapshot because this work really does take hours and days. There's so much deep reflection because who you are isn't a question people can answer in a minute, right? It's gonna take a while to go through the layers to realize, oh, I do know my elevator pitch. I can summarize myself in one minute. So the way I talk about my own self is I help people who are going through a career transition or identity crisis to understand how their multiple professional identities fit together. And I call that being a hybrid professional. And that's 
their value add and it's a new segment of the workforce. And I am a hybrid professional who researches hybrid. So I'm kind of this double person, um, but I really enjoy sharing this because I think it's empowering. I've seen people gain so much self-confidence. They really find a new way of framing themselves and talking about themselves publicly with employers, with coworkers. People are getting new jobs because of it. They're getting raises, all kinds of good things happen when you can articulate who you are. So my summary is that a hybrid professional is a worker who has multiple professional identities and they work at the intersection of those identities. It's the integration of your different sides of yourself that makes you a hybrid. And when you're integrating, there's no name for it because it's a new version of what you do. But talking about that and putting a title to it helps you explain yourself in really clear ways to people that don't understand what you know the jack and jill of all trades means. So that's a little bit about why the hybrid is such a valuable thing. So Marcus, are you ready to get started today? I guess as ready as I can be, yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> okay. sure. There's a, you, you can see this, but there's, there's a, around the screen there's post-its because I had a bit of a sit in before the session, uh, so you can't see that unfortunately because it looks mad. Um, so that's my prep. And that's... I think I'm, as long as I can still read those, um, my handwriting's really bad. Um, I'm, I'm all good. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> and just so the audience knows, I asked Marcus to do a little reflection ahead of time about his professional identities and some memories so that he had faster recall for us today, because it's really hard to put people on the spot of like, tell me a time when. And so he's a little more prepped um, with those answers. And thank you, everyone in the chat. It's great to see you joining us. So, Marcus, this is the, the essential question I start with. Are you ready? How okay. do you answer today? What do you do? Yeah, I hate that question because um, <laughs> I don't have a good answer. So uh, I normally answer that I have a background in service design and design thinking, and I help organizations to be better at what they're doing. And then I keep going on about, well, you know, it's your operational aspects, it's how your teams work, it's what products and services you're creating. And there's aspects of what I can do in all of that, which then blows things a bit. And uh, yeah, so that that's roughly how I start. And then I hope that someone's still interested. And then basically <laughs> I go on and I ask what they do. And then they give me much sharper answers. And I'm, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I normally start like that and then see where it's going. I totally resonate with that. I'm sure other people watching feel that way too it is uncomfortable to answer that what do you do question because it's hard and I was always scared of it. And so when you give that answer, how do you, like what reception do you usually get from people? Um, does it feel awkward? Do people like have questions? What usually happens after you say that? Yeah, it's usual that, I mean, I'm generally quite confident with going and talking to people, so that's not a problem itself. Um, I, it's probably two things. Um, I normally get the chance to, when I've, I'm able to follow up with a few things and ask a question, so what's this, or what, what, what do you mean by service design, or what's design thinking, for example. I can elaborate a little bit, and if I see it ringing, it sort of works, and otherwise, sometimes people can tap out, depending yeah. how nerdy I get about it. The other part yeah. is sometimes that they bring themselves in, uh, they bring anchors in, so they go, well, is, what is it about like this, or is it like that, or is it like that? And then I can gauge a bit more context and then can adjust my, narr my narrative based on their context. So because then I know what they know and I can take it from yeah. there. And that normally works quite well, but it needs that anchor of what I know in order to, for them to be comfortable to maybe engage in a conversation as much as potentially find it interesting. So that's how that goes, yeah. Well, Kudos to what you said. That's tremendous self-awareness and just noticing all the adaptability you're doing very quickly in the moment with someone to make the first right impression and also gauge their level of knowledge and defining mm -hmm. which direction you need to go very quickly. And I think we're all doing that shape-shifting real time in these networking or introductory settings. And that's a lot, right? It's exhausting and it's like this 
Rubik's cube puzzle you're trying to put together really fast so that you can like find that connection with that person. So a little bit of this identity work we're going to do today is kind of cleaning up and maybe help sharpening so you don't have to do as much like of a dance in that introduction. Um, so step one is this current state, making sure if you are struggling with your professional identity to really realize where are you today and write that down and notice how you're feeling and what you're thinking about the introduction you're giving. So that's what we were just doing in that moment is current state analysis. We're gonna move on now to digging deeper, which is about looking at what you really do in your work, not just what you say you do. Like sometimes people would say, oh, Sarah Beth, you're this innovation leader or you do strategy and design. But what does that mean? So that's where I want to start with you next. And the way we dig into what you really do is by looking at memories and stories of your work. So for anyone watching, this is best done as a visualization and going into your memory and thinking about when was a time when you felt your best at work, your brightest, you're in your flow, your zone of genius, you are just effortlessly able to manage and do multiple things. People see with you, answers are coming right away. And you're like, this is your dream. If work could be like this every moment of your life, it would just be incredible. Because these stories, when you feel that good and that aligned in your work, they're actually hybrid moments. And so when we can find and isolate these moments, you can start to unpack the identity that are hidden in there that you may not have seen in yourself before. And so it's a revealing moment for us. And that's what I'm going to try and pull right now, Mark. So I know you've already done some reflection and you have one or two stories ready. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe one of these stories for us? And just a note, as you describe it, pretend like I was there with you, but like a fly on the wall. Like I wanted to know, you know, what you're wearing and what the room looked like and who is there. So all that rich detail provide to us. Don't just assume we can see it. And um, also I might interrupt you. And that's just because I hear something or have a question. And so tell us your story and um, I'll jump in when I need to. Okay. So, um, sorry, just quickly. <laughs> a little, little drink to Chill get out a little going. bit. Yeah, it's just water. Um, so, um, so I had about three or four, and I it was really interesting to look at it and kind of go backwards in time and try to reimagine myself back in that moment and always test those moments. You know, were they quite strong? Were they really, as you described them? Uh, and I think the top one I ended up with was I uh, was in um, so I was design principal at a big transformation project at a big telco, and we were in a meeting about 20, 25 meetings, um, bigger room, big table in the middle, some people sitting, some people standing, massive whiteboard on one side. And the purpose of the meeting was, so I had been spending four to six weeks, if not more, on trying to understand how the organization works, what needs to be done. We were there to implement or to build teams, uh, teach them what design thinking is and implement that process with them or whatever they needed, new tools, new process, in order to develop new services for that company. Um, in the meeting itself, the outcome should be that in the process, we need a sort of a gating process. And the gating process had particular requirements. So we need to agree on the requirements of each gate in order to quality check or make sure that uh, the teams are following the process in a particular way or that the maturity level of the project is, is clear and so the big question in the room was, what do we need as requirements? What's what's needed, what's not needed? So it was a very kind of nuanced um, setup and a conversation to be had. And on top of that, we had, so it was the whole, the whole team, the whole transformation team was in the room, over 20 people. And uh, I had brought in this big map that I've been developing for four to six weeks, which was only my observation. So I had talked to everyone in the team and a lot of other people in the organization and dropped this mad, crazy, complex, yet tried to visualize it as simple as possible with all the elements on it required and, and put that out, which was a, a big kind of um, um, A0 on a roll kind of thing. So it covered one of the walls. Mm. 
so as much as there was a lot of communication going on and explaining people what's actually what, and because not everyone had seen this thing before, uh, the conversation then was between, I think we had at least six different practices there. So we had service designers there, we had UXs there, we had enterprise architects there, we had project managers there, uh, we had account managers there. So there's a lot of different people in there to ascertain, right, what do we really need? What's really the, the, the clarity, the, this one point at an, any particular ga gate in order to get mm -hmm. people through? Which wasn't easy because that point in time in the project really brought a lot of stuff together at the same time. So it wasn't just my map and then how the organization works. What also had happened was that the teams and some of the people in the room had worked with the client, with the teams and brought their experience into that too. Sure. And all under their different viewpoint of the different practice and the way they look at things, the way they measure things. So the point where I really got into the zone was basically after I walked people through the map, I then asked, right, so what do you think? You know, here on the first gate, we have these six things. What do you think about that? And then obviously the comments started coming out of everyone. And um, then what really happened was that I very quickly moved right into onto the whiteboard and I started just drawing things up. I was standing up, I was drawing, it's like, okay, so this, and you see this like that, oh, you want that on top, why is that? And um, then people in the room talk to each other about different views on the same thing. And as these kind of mm. conversations go, and what I found myself suddenly was that I, after the focus was all on me and my opinion and my things on the wall, on the map, suddenly completely shifted. I felt like I was lost into the room. So I was, I was just starting to be with everyone. And mm. when ev every time I saw when people were talking, not quite understanding, having an argument about the value of certain things, I sort of started to add more questions. So it's like, oh, what do you mean by this? Is this this? Is this this? If I draw that here, if I put that there, does it make sense? Um, and essentially ended up translating a lot between the different practices. So translating, um, understanding what they mean by that value, um, understanding the viewpoint and the why behind it. So it wasn't just obviously the opinion and the experience they brought in was like, but why do you think that works in this particular sense? And wouldn't it be like this and that? So we started just, you know, the map I had drawn up, basically we, we pulled it into various bits and pieces, add a lot of other ones to it, and then try to figure out what we really need, but we needed agreement. So, mm. you know, we had about two hours and we, we used all the two hours uh, and we only managed to do one gate, but it was a constant <laughs> listening and asking, what do you mean by that? Can you mm -hmm. elaborate more on that? Cause you know, I didn't know that much about enterprise architecture. I could, I had to get quite into it very quickly, but you know, there was a lot of translating their understanding. Same with some of the other aspects of the organizational processes and why they're in place and what they mean and so on. So it was a, a lot new learning as much as me trying to essentially try to synchronize or crock, don't know, anyone familiar with the term grok from some science fiction book that steve jobs like it was basically that everyone's on the same level everyone actually has as much understanding as needed of what everyone else is saying to really be able to have the right conversation to actually know what that means not just oh i don't agree because i have a different view but actually oh i understand where you're coming from right and uh are we uh so best just disconnecting reconnect you still there? Is everyone noticing a disconnect on Sarah Best's side? Because I have to have to see on my side. Oh, oopsie daisy. So cool. Okay. Yep. Okay, I'm back there. Everyone stay calm. <laughs> okay. Waiting for her to be back. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was quite a, yeah, it was a room full of energy. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. Well, you know, good stuff to come. So uh, for everyone else here, I maybe just um, close the gap of time. Um, she is, uh, okay. Yeah. So she's going to be on um, probably the in one of the 
first two weeks on January, her episode with us goes live, which was great, which led to all of this. So uh, look out for that one. Hi, everybody. There we are. All good. Okay. Are we, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, I can hear and see you. Can you hear me and see me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I have not had that happen on this before. That was really fun. Okay. Thanks for all First time for everything. Oh, yeah. I never awesome. know. <laughs> okay. So, right there, I was, I was like, not having a mini panic attack. Three but... um, so, um, <laughs> Oh, you missed the best part, Sarah. Okay, you missed the best part. I, anyway. I I missed the punchline so, to the joke. Okay, I'm I'm ready. I was, yeah, yeah, so I was, on, I was just being really silly. focusing on you. Right. Story. Okay. Two things. It's a little bit having issues again. Maybe. It seems to go up and down a bit Wait, with the quality I mean, of the network connection. Oops. Uh -oh. Yeah, there's there's something a little funny today. I'm so sorry, you all. Um, yeah. I will troubleshoot that for the future, but we'll just go with where we, we are. We right can now. still, I think we can still hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I can still. Uh, it's getting warmed up again. Should I keep talking for now and then just finish to? Because I think can my video is okay? all good. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just gonna yeah. do the best I can right now. Yeah. So, no worries. When you were talking, there were keywords that were yeah. jumping out in mm -hmm. my mind. Um, you were lost into the room. I loved that. That's sort of something of like you just got absorbed into the people and their process and their thoughts. And I don't know, there's a better way to say it, but the lost into the room phrase really got my attention. You mm -hmm. use the word translating so many different times. So I think we need to play with what that translator part of you is. Um, and you were asking the question, what do you mean by that? And, and drawing it as they were saying and asking that question multiple times. So there's this why finder that you were doing. You were constantly like finding the why and really being an investigator. Um, that's kind of the label yeah. I would give you in that moment. So these stories, again, if we had more time, we would dive into a few because you can see just one story alone, we brought up a few different sides of Marcus that he may or may not know about himself, and that was revealed yeah. through the story. But Marcus did a little bit of homework ahead of time, which I asked him to brainstorm what does he think his professional identities are. And so we've got a shared Google Doc that we're looking at. And initially, when Marcus was doing this with me, we came up with a list of words like he's a technologist, he's a design thinker, a coder, a strategist, consultant, innovator, designer, entrepreneur. And those are great words. But Marcus, why don't you talk a little bit about that activity and what started coming to your mind as you were doing that brainstorm? Yeah, I think uh, it was really interesting because uh, so in parts is sort of, I think what everyone's been, you know, done before. So and I had to do that a lot because I worked through five different industries and uh, I sometimes when I when I when I give talks, I start with a slide and show like the 15 labels I've been, you know, put on, um, and that there are those, and uh, the, the the top ones are you know service designer, technologist, um, design thinker, that kind of stuff. Now, when we looked at the three columns that are in the document, um, which are just you know list list list. Mm -hmm. um, what I found when I looked at it a second time was actually that sort of the first list with those labels, in particular, you know, design thinking and technologists, they, they always, historically, and I look back here 20 years, is um, they were very, they're very passing labels. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to give an example, you know, when I originally, I was originally did a BA in graphic design, then I was a designer, then I did an MA uh, in London at Royal College, and I was an experienced designer afterwards, then I became an interactive designer, then I was a design strategist, then a service designer, then a hypermedia lead at some point. 
which somewhat was a nerdy title someone found, but it was <laughs> responsive to that. So, you know, they're all passing. They, they all existed for two, three years, and then the next one popped up. I didn't change, but they did. So those passing right. labels, I found looking at this now again, they never describe me well. Uh, and they're actually probably quite irrelevant to a large degree. What's more interesting, especially for this session I found, was the other ones that are popping up, that are more describing maybe the, the why I do things, what yeah. and how I do things, you know? And those are more things like uh, terms like, you know, map maker. I like mapping mm -hmm. things out. Mm -hmm. Like in the, in the story example I gave you, you know, I came in with a massive map. And then I tried to remap things so that everyone agrees like where we're going on this map and why we're doing this. You know, the other thing thing is, you know, mind mindsetter or mindset changer or something, because mindset is a big thing in organizations and culture mm -hmm. of it. So I'm often brought in to shift mindsets. Um, I think shifting is better than setter because I don't want to brainwash anyone. Yes, um, but you know, it's the why. So there's the why here. It's like, why are you here? Well. I'm trying to do what's probably one of the toughest jobs in the world, it's like shifting mindsets uh, or opening up mindsets to new things. Um, and then how I do that, so you get labels like driver. I'm quite driven, I'm a doer. I, I, I like to live in both worlds, the theoretical side, yeah, it's one of the reasons why I, why I do and write books. And then uh, the right. other side, with my, sorry, yeah? I can still hear you. Can you see me? Hear me? Yeah? Can you? I, I, just, sorry, it froze for a second. Yep, you're there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, lovely. Um, so I was saying, so the how labels are more like, um, you know, a driver, I'm a doer. So I like doing things, even though I'm quite theoretical in my approach, but, you know, I like doing things. I like getting things done. I remember, you know, another highlight story there. It's a smaller story, but, you know, we had someone in the team that really needed something for the Monday, and there was a whole conversation in the room of, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe you need this and this and this. And I just, had to cut through and say, look, um, you guys can all go. I'm, I'm sitting here with him and we'll produce this thing now, whatever he needs for Monday till it's done. And then, we'll, then, then we wrap up the day because we can talk about it all night long, but actually he knows what he wants. He just has to help someone put this thing together. So let's, let's do it. So, you know, it's that kind of stuff that I really like because, um, you know, one of my labels is consultant and consultants are often rightfully so told like oh you just talk and, yeah. and, and then you go away and you let other people do the job um and i don't like that because i've always been doing things I'm, I'm, I'm a maker as well you know i like to make things and so i'm a doer and i like doing and so that's so, part of what i do and that, that's sort of the what and how right so those labels i find more appropriate than the those passing labels that i, I think a lot of people have and probably a lot of people are probably very unhappy with that is such an important point. I want to emphasize that, emphasize that, that these passing labels, generic labels, um, passive labels, however you want to say that, but that initial list that you brainstorm being a technologist, entrepreneur, or consultant are just very generic and they don't describe or give much depth. And that's really why they're insufficient and they're misidentifying who we really are. And so it's really great that you're having this insight about yourself of, well, what am I really doing? And then coming up with the map maker and the um, yeah. a mindset shifter, and you had some other labels in there. And so what you can see is that Marcus is starting to tease out and go layers deeper under what is he really doing. Um, one of the tools that I gave people as a PDF is this hybrid, um, sorry, professional identity word list. And I find it helps jog people's thinking because so often we get locked in our own boxes of like, oh, I just do marketing, I just do consulting. And then you look at this word list, you go, wait a minute, maybe I'm a storyteller or maybe I'm this, you know, uh, magician or a problem finder. And so it helps to really stimulate new language that is more accurate about who you are. So Marcus, from here, if we had more time, you know, you make this expansive list of all your possible identities and you use the stories to call out other identities. And then once we have the list of words, we have to narrow it down because yes, in identity research, you can be multiple things, so many different sides of us, but there are some identities that are more dominant and show up very frequently, usually daily. And there are other identities we use less often, they're infrequent, they're just kind of once in a while that we use that part of ourselves. 
So out of this list of words, and we can use any of the new ones that came up today, um, like the why finder or the mindset shifter, but I know you also have a list you brainstormed ahead of time. Can you narrow it down in this moment to maybe three or five? What are your top three to five that you use the most and they yes. make you feel the best? You're like, yes, I love being the pattern recognizer. You've got that one up there. So well, what well, are the, these words? Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not using those yet because a lot of them only just popped up working <laughs> with you and having a bit of a chat with you and then sitting back and thinking like, do I really want to call myself that? Because yeah. uh, I don't know about you, but I came across a couple of particular, um, you know, LinkedIn profiles or whatever, and they have mm -hmm. very uh, colorful names. You know, like the yeah. hypermedia lead I had was probably one of the worst I ever had because hypermedia, oh God, no, I'm not gonna go into that. But you know, <laughs> okay. it, it was the thing, it, it, it caused more problems than it, than it solved, you know, that kind of thing. So it was really badly chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, it was there to make a point that there's something different going on here. So it had some purpose, but I think it wasn't quite well done. So if I, I'm gonna quickly click here on the Google Doc okay. just to refresh my memory here, because I put a couple of different stars, two yeah. or three, on some of those. Or you can I think the ones them or highlight them, whatever to make them stand out. Yeah, so I got, um, so translator I had already, so okay. translator is one. Enabler I really like, because yeah. also there's a whole conversation around enabling versus yeah. empowerment and i like the mm -hmm. enabling part which again also takes me back right and that's what happened in the room as well it it, it happened quite in this particular project which one of the reasons why i choose an, uh, a moment from there because i shifted my management style quite a bit how i deal with people um more taking myself back into enabling uh, position and i really enjoyed that actually um even so it was a bit new for me um, driver, so uh, you know, I, I don't mm -hmm. want to just be known as a passive yeah. part to the equation because I know I'm good at this. Uh, yeah. Connector, connector is great because from from um, from comments from people, I had that before. You know, like uh, when I, I sometimes ask people, "Who do you think I am?" It's like, "Are oh, you great of connecting the right things together yeah. or the right people together and that kind of stuff?" So that's other people say that. So they see that in me and I, I take I take their, and I heard it more than once, so I take that. Yeah. A map maker, I actually like even so I just put it in today. Because um, I think, I, I actually have, I have a couple of books on maps because I love mm -hmm. them. They're great mm -hmm. to visualizing. I'm very visual, uh, which is probably yeah. why I ended up doing a BA in graphic design. So, so drawing things up and visualizing things. Yeah. I found a lot in workshops, especially when you have ideation workshops. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is a really great tool, and I love using that tool to actually bring consensus in the in the room or totally. to materialize things, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's a reason, and it's a bit notorious as well, to use Lego for workshops because suddenly things are here and there, and suddenly you see that they are too close or too far so, apart, Marcus, uh, and that helps. I'm going to speed Sorry. us up a little bit. No, it's good. Oh, I, yeah. I love how you're thinking through the why you're selecting each thing, and then you can mm. have an, a piece of evidence to connect to them. Um, yeah. And I'm hearing you even get more descriptive on how you do the map making and, as, and specific ways that you use map making as opposed to other people that might use them for data or um, more analytical research. Um, yeah. And you're also visualizing things that are abstract. You're making sense of Mm -hmm. really big, hard to describe things through visual efforts, um, drawing or maps. So from these kind of top identities, and it doesn't matter so much right now that we get them perfect. I usually have people aim for like 70% um, clarity or feeling really strong about them. You can always massage yeah. and change the words later. But this is where I have people draw a Venn diagram. And in each circle of the Venn diagram, this one's mine, you put one of your identity words. So the Venn diagram, yep. you need to have at least two circles. Three is, I think, the easiest. And four circles, if you need to use four identities, is the most because it makes it um, too big after that. Yeah. And now what we're going to start doing is the third step, which, which is investigating the intersections. And so this is a little sticky. This is the part where people usually go, whoa, I've never thought about this before. Because what you're doing is asking yourself, who am I when I am combining two identities or all three at once? Who am I here and here? And what can happen is sometimes the words you've already pulled out, like map maker, might yeah. be the name of 
the connector and, you know, driver mm -hmm. identities together. Maybe that's what you're calling yourself when you're doing that. But essentially, yeah. we're going to be changing the, the words and playing with where they belong and what you're doing in spaces of convergence. Yeah. So to play with that for a moment, can is anything jumping out to you right now? Do you see any of these words connecting in ways that you're like, oh, this is an obvious one. When I'm doing this and this, I'm totally doing that. Um, yeah, I think maybe, again, the translator has been popping up quite a bit and that's used it with the map maker because it makes mm -hmm. sense. I, I was just sort of like Doug was saying navigator. Yeah. It's quite interesting as well because as a navigator, you need a map, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think if, if we can bring those two things together, for example, yeah. it's quite interesting because translation and map making, map make is a language in itself. Yeah. Um, plus it's a language without necessarily language on it so it's more visual that mm -hmm. more people can understand which goes totally. for the translation i think works closely quite well, well what, what it would be i don't know would it be like yeah what i'm wondering right now too is maybe in the main circles the dominant identities are still the service designer and the entrepreneur okay but maybe in the heart in the center of that venn diagram is this map making navigator identity that emerges from all three we may have already gotten to a stage of understanding your core without realizing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Does that, how does that feel when I say that? You just kind of lit up. It's great. I mean, you know, that's the thing. You know, you never know when you when you hit the spot, right? Because you're just trying mm -hmm. to explore. And I get this experience as well in a lot of projects. You kind of explore, explore. Suddenly, you go, "Hang on a second. Yeah. Which was actually reminds me of you know i came up with the title of, of the book and the company the wicked company because suddenly you know I put that like oh maybe that's a good name and then someone went oh yeah that's super cool oh i wish my company had that name this is so great and it's like wicked problems wicked company awesome there you go yeah and suddenly it clicked mm. it just clicked you never know where it came from. it just came out of yeah. not nowhere but you know quite surprisingly so and and so, yeah. tuning into that that click the aha epiphany is what I want people to recognize when they're doing this work for themselves, that if you have something that jumps out, like that's a great clue, you're onto mm -hmm. it. Um, a couple of people in the chat just mentioned maybe you're Columbus. Getting reactions here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing. And, yeah, <laughs> so, and I think this is another great tool not to do professional identity work in a silo by yourself, having other yeah. people around to bounce off of and reflecting, especially with people that know you closely and can say, Marcus, I've seen you do this thing. You're actually yeah. the navigator when you're doing that. Did you realize it? And this yeah. is great. Doug and Linda are just popping all kinds of ideas. I wish you guys were doing all the work for us. us. Yeah. Doing it for <laughs> us. Um, but eventually when we get to the end of this, I have um, a hybrid professional uh, elevator pitch and that's one of the freebies. And it's a mad lib. And what I'm hearing in your voice um, that we're leading to Marcus is when you do your introduction of I'm a design thinker, service designer, whatever these words, and that means that I help people navigate by doing map making into the unknown. Like maybe you end up finishing the statement using these new keywords that you build are very true to how you work and who you are. What mm -hmm. do you think? Definitely. I think, you know, there's a lot of things generally around finding the right language and identity, but not just that, also reality, right? So yeah. we define our reality through those words. <clears throat> That's what a lot of groups of people often have issues with each other because the words don't align and that kind of stuff. So I'm talking translator again. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. It's brilliant. It feels really good. <laughs> okay, still there, you're frozen. Oh no. Untangler, yeah. Hi. Okay. So yeah, thanks for all for all, the, all the really good uh, drink more wine. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, any excuse, Marcus. right? Oh, hey, there we are. Oh, you're now on the other side. <laughs> it's like dropping me today. I know. Drink more wine, Sarah. Come back. Thanks, you guys, for cheering the me wine. on. I wine, just want to keep it interesting. <laughs> more yeah, surprises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us our toes. Well, um. So what we can do now, Marcus, is play more with what your hybrid title might be based on some mm -hmm. of these new keywords. So the investigating intersections, I did 
cut that a little short, that can be a lot of work right there because you start to do math of like, who am I as a translator enabler or the map maker connector or the entrepreneur yeah. driver, whatever your primary identities, then you start to really kind of add them together. So speeding that up, we started looking at keywords that were already coming through because what you find are patterns that are emerge in the intersections, like the pattern of map making, map making might be really consistent and you go, wow, that's a thread, that's a through line of my identities. Mm -hmm. That one's really strong. So do you have any fun language that's coming to your mind of, you know, if you were to call yourself by a hybrid title like the, I don't know, abstract map maker or navigator, what's just, we can just free think this. I don't know. I mean, in recent times, I, you know, try to drop quite a bit of any of the design stuff because the label, even design thinking confused a lot of people because yeah. there's this thing between design thinking, design doing, and no one <laughs> knows the better of it. And, uh, you know, um, so I think, you know, the strategy aspect for me, so if we take the strategist as a, as a more generic kind of label, and if, if we call it like a strategic navigator or strategic map maker, mm -hmm might not be bad, right? Because nice. um, I think that's something that goes into the testing thing. Oh, I can go, okay, let's think about it. Let's see and explore it. You know, I think it goes quite well. Um, or so the maybe, mind maybe shifting just a little bit map maker. The mind shifting, oh Jesus, no no pressure at all. Um, <laughs> the sound, this sounds more like I'm doing one of those funny pictures where you have to look at in a particular way for the, for the ship to come out or something. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, maybe um, strategic mindset. I, I, the mind thing is good. I really like mm -hmm. that. I wonder mm -hmm. if it goes as far as culture. Yeah. Because culture is such a big thing. And I was just talking to, to Troy, my you know, co-host on, 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 on the Wicked Podcast about it and saying, you know, consultancies and the cultural shift in organization is a big thing. And a lot, it's, it's, it's mentioned often, but never quite described right. And I find that. So I wonder if there's something there because culture and mindset are so close together if it's maybe more cultural thing. But culture mm. is such a big complex thing. I'm so like, it's uh, too big, it's too big a cake. Maybe navigator to wicked results could be your title. Navigator to wicked results. Yeah. You're the captain yeah. navigator or something. Um, yeah. I, so well, what's, I, yeah, yeah. what's happening here, just to give a little more color, landing on a hybrid title is a creative process. And I use things like adding words together, modifying, adding descriptor words to kind of keep this testing going. And you know you've landed on a great title when you test it with other people and you sort of get this like, oh, interesting response. Like people sort of feel a vibe from it or it increases their curiosity in you. And obviously we're trying to avoid it being too jargony or trendy or overly, um, you know, funny. And so that's sort of the balancing act of coming up with something like, the mindset navigator person without sounding too weird. You have to feel confident about it too. That's really critical. So my homework for you after today is mm -hmm. start playing with these top words that we've come up with in this session and test them out in terms of calling yourself by them. Because the beautiful thing about this is you get to define the meaning. So I call myself a creative disruptor. Well, that's a new title that hasn't been used really. And I then finish my introduction with, I'm Sarah Beth, I'm this creative disruptor, which means that I radically transform how people and systems work together. So I give my definition after I do my introduction. Yeah. So I'm catching people's attention, but then kind of helping them digest it. Yeah. It's a lot of work, but when you, find it, it really helps open people's minds and eyes to what you really do aside from I'm Marcus, an entrepreneur or a technologist, right? Absolutely. I think, you know, and again, as I, the, the pattern recognizer sits somewhere, but that's, yeah, doesn't yeah. have to come in at the moment. But, you know, a lot of things when I listen to someone, I have about three, four, five things flying in my head, go, oh, it's like this, or, you know, that's similar. And the thing there, yeah, every project, every project ever is cat herding. Anyway, yeah. um, do you think um, finding finding the name to the book, right? Mm -hmm. To really be able to land on wicked problems or turning, you know, creating wicked companies who are companies that can solve wicked problems better. Sort of my line. 
is uh, it's great to finally land on that where you go. I know exactly what it means. I know what I want, and I can explain it to you. And yeah. you know, give me time. But that now is my mission. So and have finding that as an identity or as a mission, uh, that's great because it, it it creates a, an amazing focus mm -hmm. where all the other thousand things that are flying around suddenly you know if they can dock on and make sense with you or not. And that saves a tons of time because it knows where your attention needs to go. Yeah, yes. it's just, it clarifies things and focuses things and therefore, you know, it made me more productive. It uh, made it clear what I want to do with the podcast and with everything else I do, and what kind of projects I'm looking for and why, you know, that's, that, that's brilliant. And if the, my identity helps there in order to sell this is yeah. perfect. Yeah. And I mean, identity is your personal brand. I mean, this really is branding work. But I also think mm -hmm. it's bigger than that. Um, when you were creating your identity list, you were saying, wow, at first I just started with these passive labels for myself. Then I realized they start to describe, you know, why I do and how I do what I do. And you're getting into these layers of your passion and your purpose. And the identity is the name you give to that. That's the third element of who are you when you're doing the things you love to do and want to do in work. And so I think identity is a really important piece of discussing the workforce, because if we just use labels people give to us, we all sound the same. And the whole point is we have to differentiate ourselves. People need to understand what they're hiring you for and what your unique abilities are. So I want to yeah. transition into talking about these, these wicked companies. You started to allude to that a moment ago that you got clarity around it and then the book came out of it. Yes, and I think that was really great. Um, I think the first time we talked after the, I think there's parts of it during the podcast and, and, and when we had to chat after, separately from that, is that um, those things tie in really well together. Because, uh, so, you know, there's wicked problems and there's tame problems, and tame problems are very easy to understand problems where you can gather enough information and you know what it is, so you can create a solution and you can... Uh, pretty much predict the outcome. Wicked problems, we can't do that. Wicked problems are classically uh, things like poverty, crime, those kind of things. Um, through our new technology, because we're all interconnected, and wicked problems tend to be quite people problems, uh, we have more of those than ever. And as companies, we haven't been set up to solve those. So a lot of companies are uh, historically struggling solving those. Change and transformation are most likely the most wicked problem a lot of companies have. And they currently have a failure rate of about, I think, 70% to create the benefits they were seeking. So you can tell there's something not quite working there. There needs to be something yeah. new. And for me, it's to basically give those type of problems, which have different characteristics, the name. So if you can start naming something, you actually know a bit more what it is, you understand it more. And that's the crux of that. So we need wicked companies, not tame companies, to solve wicked problems better. And we need to address these different characteristics. If we don't, we keep failing. So and that's what I'm here for. And hybrid workers fit into that because they bring in all these different parts of themselves that are complex by nature and multidisciplinary and don't fit into just one kind of work. So exactly. So the thing is that, um, if you think of a tame problem as a contained block, and often we like to talk about verticals on this in the market or whatnot in products. So you have these kind of slithers of reality mm -hmm. that we're good at, we're right there. If it's sitting within there, it's great. And this thing, we're good too. But what about all the middle ground? Because the middle ground is part of reality. It's part of our personal customer problems or our personal problems. It's part of what an organization has to tackle in ever which way. Um, but we're not that great at it unless we start looking at that place and you can only look at that place if you go into this hybrid space essentially and start combining things that only previously existed in those verticals and actually start exploring that so a there's great opportunity there for new types of companies addressing that but there's also great opportunity for new types of people to really to really redefine what they do because they need to do different things and not be able to look at those places and that's where this hybrid stuff comes in and that's what makes it so such a great opportunity or great value, I think, for any future company. So that 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 was my, you know, I jumped straight onto that when we had you on the on the podcast. Like, of course, 
Meet of lots course. of more hybrid, hybrid people. Yeah. And, and I think there's synergy here with innovation because everything I've learned in the innovation world is that it's at the intersection of two existing ideas where a third one emerges that we never thought of before. Um, you know, a Camelback is a new product. It combines water bottles and backpacks. Why not marry those together into a whole new design where they're, they're connected? They're just one. So I think identity is similar. You're taking existing identities and merging them into something where there's a new identity coming out and it helps to solve these wicked problems and in wicked companies because you see different sides of it. I mean, your ability to draw these gateways and to map out thinking and then to question, question, question is helping people see the unseen and look at the intersection of problems. Um, and it's yeah. really hard work. It so is, but, but I think the really good thing to understand is, or the really positive thing to understand is that uh, it's not like that's something necessarily new, right? So mm -hmm. I like to say that uh, life is our, is your first ever wicked problem, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Every day is different. Every, mm -hmm. every day there's something new and you have to spend energy doing something about it in your life, at work, whatever, with your friends, whatever it means, uh, wherever you look. So we're already doing it and we're not just one thing we are multiple things exactly. so everyone is already having that in themselves it just organizations need to be able to enable that right mm -hmm. and previously and again historically ever since industrial revolution and the skilling uh, every organization tries to put you in a little silo yeah. and we all know those silos we know them perfectly well and we don't like that because we're all more complex we all have more than one skill in us and so it shouldn't be too big a shift to develop these new type of organizations, I think. Uh, and it doesn't need, um, you know, you don't need, don't need to be a rocket science to do that. Uh, it's already in us. And that's what I've found in a lot of transformational yeah. projects, because the second you open, you create a context where you can be more open with people, they open up because yeah. they have it already. And that for me is always my highlight in my work to, to see that happening. I think that's a perfect nutshell for what the future of work is that we have to get beyond these silos of teams and ways of thinking. And we've been stuck in these old industrial models of what a company and organization is and the hierarchical structures and the new digital age with AI and all the technology coming in is forcing us to break out of those boxes and companies that can radically reshape how they do work will be the ones that adapt and survive. And companies stuck in siloed ways of thinking and keeping people in one box they're going to yeah. struggle. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. I just want to remind everyone that's still here that we are giving a copy of a, our books away. Mm -hmm. So clip a moment from today's video or do whatever you'd like to do on a LinkedIn post and tag us so you can be eligible. We just have a couple moments left. And um, Marcus, I'm wondering on the spot if you can give any top three tips or piece of advice of what helps a wicked company? You know, what have you seen that they need to do or what are their strategies um, based on your research and thinking? Yeah, there's about three things. And, um, you know, the, 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 the bottom one is the easiest one because most distributed top one, I think is probably least I've seen um, in a lot of organizations. So it's, it's three parts. So there's, there's um, understanding the problem better or describing it better. Then there is, um, efficiency versus effectiveness, it's sort of the middle ground. And then there is experimentation. Mm. Experimentation we're all most familiar with because a lot of companies are already starting to do that, but mainly in the delivery side of things, they're not often doing it before. But, you know, the best performing companies at the moment, they run like a thousand experiments every month and they try a lot of small yeah. things, many, many small things. So they learn a lot about the problem they are, the wicked problem they are actually addressing and getting to know the problem better and better every day. There's a lot of failure there, but they're very small failure. They're very, it's sustainable failure. And they keep progressing, getting better and better mm -hmm. at solving the problem, which will never be fully solved, by the way. It's one sure. of the characteristics of the problem. So it keeps going, it's great. It's gonna keep us busy for a long time. The middle ground is efficiency versus effectiveness. So um, what's not always happening in organizations is that a lot of organizations look at doing, making something a bit more effective and thinking that will bring them the next growth or gain, and it just doesn't. Effectiveness is what you need to shift, and it's a bit of a shift in mindset to say, 
look at measure by effectiveness, not by efficiency. Mm -hmm. Efficiency is a small little extra effectiveness. It's the, the stuff that sets you up for exponential impact, exponential revenue growth and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the middle ground. And then uh, the describing the problem, understanding it on the top. I'm waiting a second here if I see you. Are you still there by audio? Can you still hear me? Sorry, Beth. No, maybe I not. I can hear you. I can hear oh, you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Great, yes. great, great. So I keep talking. Um, and the top is then um, understanding the problem <laughs> better. So that's okay. We'll still see you. Uh, uh, a lovely picture there. Um, so the uh, describing the problem in the right <laughs> way, because it's been proven for decades in project management 101 that the first step you take, or the better you understand the problem in the beginning, the better you set it up the better everything else afterwards will behave and the more de-risk yeah. it will be. And a lot of companies don't spend time enough, and I think there's a big flaw in leadership describing the problem in the right way, what they're expecting, what they're assuming, these kind of things. And they don't seem to be learning that either. So at the moment, there's a big discrepancy seemingly between what the top knows and sometimes they use as a strategy that's drawn up. Yeah. And then let's say, on the ground, the teams who are now starting to do customer research, those insights don't seem to flow back all the way back, not in the level they should. And so there's work to be done on the leadership level uh, to improve sure. that, to better set the direction and then say, and, and, and be open enough to say, I don't have all the answers. I'm an enabler. I'm not mm -hmm. the decision maker. That's a big shift that's happening. So those three aspects are sort of help quite well to target those new characteristics of wicked problem and to you know be better at um you know hitting them um profoundly so to say so to speak mm -hmm. that, that yeah. was a that was a terrific that, that was a terrific set of three things to really pay attention to and it occurred to me how similar that is a lot in your identity too who you are and getting clear on that very much of yeah. what is the problem we're trying to solve and getting better at that and then this experimentation stage of you have different identities you've been accumulating them over time over many jobs and career changes and so you have to keep re-experimenting with who are you now what do you call yourself now do people respond well to this title versus that title and that iteration of our own identity development is part of our growth and change same with companies, same with people. And that synergy of companies are made of people. And so they both go hand in hand. It's really great stuff. Yeah. So we're just at the top of the hour. And Marcus, I've had a great time listening to you. I know you're just too. so sophisticated in this concept of wicked companies. <laughs> and I've thoroughly enjoyed all of our interviews and times together. Um, I'm so sorry, everyone, for the tech. It's, you know, still learning this new hybrid virtual world. Um, hopefully it gave people a taste of what you need to do for yourself if you're a person who wears a lot of hats and struggles to introduce how you, what you do. And now you can see some of these tools of this is the process of finding your hybridity. We did it in rapid fire. Marcus was the best um, test case I could have asked for today because you've been thinking about this and, and you get it. And then it's just we have to keep playing with language and brainstorming more. And I appreciated the, the comments and chat because it helped us even brainstorm in this moment. So anything else you wanna share before we go? No, I'm just like, uh, you know, whenever I talk to you, it doesn't feel like work, so that's great. Um, and <laughs> that's great. Uh, even so it, it, it digs down into things that, I think in particular this one, uh, and I think we need to do more on that on the podcast to yeah. dig deeper into these things. Yeah. Cause they get quite close and personal. And as you rightly said, for me, problem solving is a universal thing and I can use mm -hmm. that anywhere. You know, I'm looking into other aspects of really applying that to life and you're doing it to some extent in terms of identity, yeah. but I think there's other problems people have, uh, not just around their own identity, but what they want to do, you know, how to look at different aspects of their life. And yes. you, you, you know, can apply the same stuff to it, you know, experimentation, trying to yeah. see what makes an effect or not. And describing things because mm -hmm. when you start describing things you start learning things and you start yeah. thinking about it differently so for oh. me i like the fact that i'm doing something that feels quite essential to who we are and uh therefore i can get quite excited about that because it's it's yeah. it's something that isn't just a throwaway or isn't just something that you know makes money for me it's really something yeah. i truly believe in 
Agreed. And which is why it's not easy to settle and stick with something because you know life's not quite mm. like that. No. It's not um, linear anymore. No. No, so it Marcus, never is. Really quick, yeah. how can anyway, people so. find you? What what should they follow online to find you? Yes. So uh, if you scroll all the way back, or um, you know, um, I think after this, I think there's something in the text. I'm easy to find on on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, there's the wickedcompany.com and slash podcast where my website with the book and the podcast yeah. is. Uh, most things you find likely on LinkedIn where I'm most active at the moment, Perfect. I think. And so it's easy there. Just uh, you know, drop me a line or connect or like, share, and comment on the podcast and everything else. I say it yeah. helps. Marcus's the news. podcast. Um, he has a co-host. They are just an, an amazing co-host team. One of my favorite interviews <laughs> I've done. Um, more than my title dot com is how you can all find and follow me. And there's a bunch of links if you click on that click for giveaway button in this screen where we showed you how to find us. And people are asking for an encore. They really appreciate the vulnerability. I agree. I think more of these, maybe we'll do another session with Marcus or other guests in the future. So I had a great time today. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we hope you'll follow up and stay in touch with us. Bye everyone. Thank Bye, you everyone. Marcus. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.